Rapid assembly is the key to accomplishing the ground tactical plan. So your ability to group under canopy is important. What happens under your canopy makes all the difference in what happens to you down here on the ground when you land. Your canopy control will determine if you land near other jumpers or in the rocks or trees and can make the difference between a hard or soft landing. This program will address good canopy control techniques. You will learn how the MC6 parachute works and you will learn how to maneuver your parachute in various wind conditions. Your first step is to understand how the MC6 parachute works and to learn some basic parachute maneuvering terms. The principles that explain the movement of a parachute through the air are fairly simple. A canopy's forward speed might be compared to blowing up a balloon and letting it go. The air rushing out the back of the balloon propels the balloon forward. The MC6 moves forward because air is vented out of dry modifications in the back of the canopy as it descends. The forward speed of the parachute depends on the weight of the jumper. The average speed of the MC6 is 10 knots. It's important to understand the term forward speed really means air speed. The air speed of a canopy is the same whether it is faced into the wind or faced downwind. However, ground speed increases when a canopy is faced downwind and decreases when the canopy is faced into the wind. Here we see a canopy with a 10 knot forward speed will have a ground speed of 22 knots when faced downwind with a velocity of 12 knots. This same 10 knot canopy will drift backwards at 2 knots when faced into the same wind. No matter which way a canopy is faced in relationship to the wind, the speed it moves through the air is the same. It's only in relationship to the ground that we see the effect of the wind. It may help to think of the wind as a block of air that moves across the ground. If we can't see the ground, we can't see that the block of air is moving. Inside this block of air, the canopy moves forward at a constant rate, no matter what direction it's facing. It's only when the ground is added to the picture that the ground speed becomes apparent. Now our block of air looks like wind. The block of air moves across the ground and the canopy moves within this block of air. Air speed is always the same, but ground speed depends on which way the canopy is faced. Incidentally, for the same reason, descent rate is unrelated to the wind. A parachute's descent rate is the same no matter what direction it's faced in relationship to the wind. Just going will not get you to the desired landing area very often. You have to steer your parachute to the desired landing area. You need to be able to turn your parachute, redirect its forward speed to make it go where you want it to go, and control ground speed. This is accomplished with the steering slots on the sides of the MC6 parachute. The steering slots are two extended gores on each side of the parachute. Extra material is used to raise the steering gores and an overlap at the top and bottom prevents air from spilling out vertically as the canopy descends. To direct your parachute, steering lines are attached to the steering slots of the canopy. The toggles for the steering lines are located on the front of the rear set of risers. You steer the parachute by pulling the toggles that are attached to the ends of the steering lines. Pull the right steering toggle and you close the steering slot on that side of the canopy while the opposite slot remains open. The air moving through these open slots will turn you to the right. Pull the left toggle and the canopy will turn left. If you pull the toggle just a few inches, the canopy will turn slowly. Pulling at the shoulder level will create a faster turn. When turning, the canopy doesn't simply pivot on a straight axis. This is because it's continuing to move forward throughout the turn. For example, at the end of a gentle 180 degree turn, the canopy will end up off to the side. A slow turn has a wider turning radius than a fast turn. Pulling both steering toggles at the same time is called braking. As you pull both steering toggles past quarter brake or shoulder level, and on down to three-quarter brake or waist level, the braking slots progressively open. These braking slots are designed to vent air forward and counteract the air vented to the rear of the canopy by the dry modifications. In addition to this, as the canopy slows, small slots along the front edge of the canopy skirt begin to vent air forward. At full arm extension, the extended gores are completely closed. Braking slots are fully open and the air is vented out the small slots in the front of the canopy. In this situation, the volume of air vented forward is more than the volume of air vented to the rear, and the MC6 moves backwards. 
pulling both steering toggles down to quarter brakes will begin to slow the forward speed of the canopy. At this point, the extended gores are partially closed and the braking slots are beginning to open, venting some air forward. Half brakes or about chest level produces a noticeable reduction in the forward speed. The greatest braking effectiveness occurs at about waist level or the three-quarter brake position. This will produce the slowest forward speed. However, the braking response is not immediate. The toggles need to be held down for several seconds before the braking response takes effect. Between full brakes or hip level, the canopy passes through a transition zone or stall state from forward flight to reverse flight. You should avoid holding the canopy in the transition zone or stall state because the canopy is slightly unstable, tending to skid or slip, and the descent rate increases significantly. If you start from the toggles up position and pull both toggles to full arm extension, the canopy will slowly pass through the transition zone, then stabilize and reverse flight at about three knots. Descent rate in reverse flight is slightly higher than the toggles up descent rate. While braking does slow a canopy's forward speed through the air, Keep in mind that braking doesn't always slow ground speed. The effect of braking on ground speed depends on the way in which the canopy is faced in relation to the wind. When you're faced downwind, braking will always slow your ground speed. When you're faced into the wind in low wind conditions and the canopy is moving forward across the ground, braking also slows your ground speed. But if you're faced into the wind in high wind conditions, and you're already drifting backwards, braking will make you drift backwards even faster. Using brakes to slow ground speed in low wind conditions, or to increase ground speed in high wind conditions, are both useful canopy control techniques. Before we move on, let's review what we've learned so far. MC6 parachutes have steering slots, drive modifications, and braking modifications. The steering slots and drive modifications give the canopy forward speed. However, the ground speed of the canopy depends on which way it's faced in relationship to the wind. Steering lines are attached to steering slots. Pulling a steering toggle will cause the canopy to turn. Pulling both steering toggles at the same time is called braking. Quarter brakes or toggles at shoulder level should be used in 8 to 13 knot wind conditions. This is not enough to slow forward speed, but does produce a minimum descent rate. Half brakes or toggles at chest level is used in four to eight knot wind conditions. Three quarter brakes or toggles at waist level slows the canopy's forward speed and should be used in zero to four knot wind conditions. At full brakes, the MC6 will back up. There is a transition zone between three quarter brakes and full brakes where the canopy becomes somewhat unstable. Holding the canopy in this transition zone or stall state should be avoided. The effects of braking on ground speed depends on wind conditions and the direction the canopy is faced. By now you should understand the design features of the MC6 and how to turn and brake your canopy by pulling the steering toggles. But there's more than one way to pull a toggle and how you pull the toggle has a lot to do with whether or not you'll land safely. Good canopy control requires a smooth, gentle technique. The MC6 is a very stable parachute, but like any parachute, it is subject to oscillation. Oscillations are caused by one of two things, turbulent air or poor toggle technique. You can't control the air, but you can avoid quick jerky toggle movements and fast turns. These movements can cause oscillations, and close to the ground, oscillations can increase your chance of being injured on landing. Oscillations cause two problems. First, when a canopy is oscillating, it's tipping and spilling air. This increases your descent rate and increases your chance of being injured on landing. Even a small increase in descent rate produces a big increase in landing impact. Second, if you land during an oscillation, there's a good chance that you hit it at an odd angle, again increasing your chance of getting injured. Some jumpers say that smooth toggle control is only important close to the ground. Their point is that oscillations at high altitude can't hurt you, but it is difficult to perceive your drift when you're oscillating. So the best practice is to develop a habit of always using smooth toggle movements. Let's take a look at various toggle actions and see how the MC6 reacts. The MC6 has a very stable flat turn characteristic, but extremely fast turns cause the canopy to change directions in a hurry. Suspended under the canopy in this situation, 
the jumper swings to one side as the turn begins and then back again like a pendulum. This causes the canopy to tip and spill air, producing a side-to-side -side oscillation. Quickly releasing the toggles can produce a fore and aft oscillation. As the jumper quickly releases brakes, the canopy surges forward, but the jumper lags behind, producing a fore and aft oscillation and potentially a hard landing. The way to prevent oscillations is to develop a habit of smooth, gentle toggle control. In fact, fast, jerky toggle movements just aren't needed. There are a few more terms and concepts you need to understand before we start applying them to actual parachute maneuvering. Parachute maneuvering would be easy if it weren't for the wind. In fact, if there wasn't any wind, you wouldn't need a steerable parachute at all. You could exit the aircraft right over the desired landing area and come straight down and hit the landing area every time. But, of course, there's almost always some wind. You'll hear the term wind line and wind cone a lot when talking about canopy control. The wind line is an imaginary line on the ground running in the direction the wind is blowing and passing through the landing area. Parachute maneuvering is generally done back and forth across the wind line. The wind cone is an imaginary cone starting at your designated point of impact and fanning out left and right of the wind line. The wind cone is the area that you can maneuver the canopy in and still land at the desired point. The wind cone expands and shrinks depending upon prevailing winds. In higher wind conditions, the cone narrows, meaning a smaller area in which you can maneuver your canopy and allow you to land at the desired landing area. Lower wind conditions allow for a wider wind cone and more room to maneuver the canopy in for a safe, successful on-target landing. The wind cone also gets smaller as you descend. Halfway to the ground, it's half what it was at exit altitude. The closer to the ground, the smaller the wind cone becomes. If you get outside of the wind cone at any time during your descent, you will not be able to get to the landing area. When you start jumping, the phrase stay upwind will be frequently used. Later in this program, you'll learn that almost all parachute maneuvering occurs on the upwind side of the landing area. Due to the number of jumpers on some operations, you may be released downwind of the landing area, where you'll be required to hold into the wind attempting to drive to the landing area. There are exceptions in light wind conditions, but generally you need to stay upwind. Running, holding, and crabbing are basic parachute handling terms. Running means facing the canopy downwind, adding the forward speed of the canopy to the wind. For example, on a day when there is a seven knot ground wind, if you run with the wind using a canopy that has a 10 knot forward speed, your ground speed will be 17 knots. Holding means facing your canopy into the wind. In this case, the canopy's forward speed works directly against the wind. For example, if you hold your 10 knot canopy in a seven knot wind, you'll move forward across ground at three knots. Keep in mind that if the wind velocity exceeds the forward speed of your canopy, you'll drift backwards. Crabbing is the term used to describe facing the canopy across the wind. You can crab directly across the wind, somewhat upwind, or somewhat downwind. When you're crabbing, ground speed and ground track depend on the angle the parachute is faced in relation to the wind. For example, if you crab directly crosswind in a seven knot wind, you'll drift downwind at seven knots while your canopy is moving directly crosswind at 10 knots. Ground speed and ground track will be the result of both the canopy's forward speed and the wind drift. S-turns are a maneuvering technique where a jumper turns back and forth across the wind line and inside the wind cone. S-turns allow you to see the landing area while you maneuver and lose altitude while staying upwind. S-turns also keep you from getting too far away from the wind line and can be used to adjust your rate of approach into the landing. Wind cone, wind line, running, holding, crabbing, and S-turns. You've just been introduced to a lot of new terms and concepts, but as we continue talking about canopy handling, they'll all become more and more familiar to you until they're part of your vocabulary. In part two of this video, we'll introduce you to the key rules for good canopy control.
Experienced canopy pilots apply a few basic rules and procedures on every jump. After exiting the jump platform and completing the first three points of performance, good tight body position and count, check canopy and gain canopy control, and keep a sharp lookout during your descent, it's a good time to conduct a canopy controllability check to ensure your canopy is reacting correctly. Look left and then turn left 90 degrees, then look right and turn right 90 degrees. Immediately after your canopy controllability check, locate your group leader and the landing area. Throughout the jump, you should be aware of other jumpers in your group. Canopy collisions are dangerous and should be avoided. Ensure that you maintain at least 50 feet of separation between canopies. And remember the three rules of the air. Look before you turn. Turn right to avoid head-on collisions. Lower jumper has the right of way. If you ever find yourself in a position where a collision cannot be avoided, spread your arms and legs. This may prevent you from becoming entangled in the other jumper's suspension lines. Now you're ready to evaluate your drift. For your initial drift evaluation, turn your canopy into the wind. As you look past your boots to the ground, you'll be able to see which way you're drifting. You can see if you're moving forward over the ground or drifting backwards. Another good time to check drift is when you're facing directly crosswind. Bring your canopy to full brakes then you can see your sideways drift. This shows the amount of drift caused by the wind and your rate of approach to the landing area. In addition to your perception of drift, if there is smoke on or around the DZ, it can give you information about ground wind, direction, and velocity. Sometimes you may be drifting backwards at altitude, but the smoke will tell you that it's calm on the ground. Sometimes the smoke shows that the ground wind is blowing from a different direction than your wind at altitude. This is useful information for planning your approach strategy. The wind determines the direction you'll face when making your final approach for landing, and whether you'll make your approach from the upwind or downwind side of the landing area. During a parachute descent, you evaluate drift continuously, all the way to the ground, but your initial drift check gets you started on the right foot. Maneuvering a canopy to land is a matter of continuously judging wind drift perceiving your rate of approach to the landing area, and then running, holding, crabbing, or braking as necessary to land in the drop zone. Remember to do your maneuvering close to the wind line. Throughout your descent, use the same techniques used for your initial drift evaluation to continuously reevaluate wind conditions. Look past your boots to check the direction you're moving, Evaluate your rate of approach and pay attention to the smoke on the DZ or anything that might indicate wind direction. Be ready to immediately maneuver your canopy based upon your perceptions. Winds can change during a parachute descent. Continuously evaluating wind conditions readies you to respond to any changes you may encounter. Prior to beginning your final approach, you should keep this in mind. Do not fly over anything that you are not willing to land on. Arriving in position for your final approach is the primary objective of your maneuvering and drift evaluation until you've descended to between 500 and 250 feet above the ground. At this point, it's time to establish your final approach for landing. You should be on the wind line, faced into the wind, and be in position so that only braking or gentle S-turns are needed to steer your parachute to the landing area. In no wind conditions, you will be able to make your final approach from any direction. In low wind conditions, you can make your final approach from the downwind side of the landing area. You will be on the wind line, faced into the wind, and facing the landing area. Be careful not to get too far downwind or you won't be able to get back. In high wind conditions, final approach is made from the upwind side of the landing area, and you'll land drifting backwards. Even in very light wind conditions, you must always land facing into the wind. We can't emphasize enough how important this is. If you're not faced into the wind for landing, your horizontal ground speed will be too fast and there's a good chance that you'll be injured. The maximum allowable ground wind for a safe landing is 13 knots. Consider what your landing would be like running with this much wind with approximately a 10 knot canopy. This adds up to about 23 knots. That's a real leg breaker. Even if the wind is only three or four knots, there's a big difference between a downwind landing and an into the wind landing. For a safe landing, it's also important to use some degree of brakes, even in no wind conditions. 
In no wind conditions, a toggles up landing produces a ground speed of 10 knots. This is too fast for a safe landing. Using some brakes will slow your ground speed for landing. A toggle position between one half and three quarter brakes is required for landing the MC6 in no wind conditions. You can look and see if you're using the right amount of brakes and if slowed down enough for a comfortable landing. When jumping in steep terrain, the rule here is to land across the hill. Landing into a hill is a good way to get injured. And if you try to land downhill, you'll find it's hard to get to the ground and exciting trying to do a PLF. The need to avoid landing into a hill or down slope may override the normal procedure of landing faced into the wind. You may need to land crabbing across the wind line. Another reason to modify normal final approach procedures is if there are hazards on the ground. For example, if a normal into the wind final approach requires that you pass over hazards, it may be a good idea to plan a crabbing approach so that you won't pass over these hazards. This way, if the wind dies or if you've misjudged, you've avoided the possibility of landing on the hazards. In fact, on all jumps there's a possibility of wind change or misjudgment that makes it impossible to land near the IP or even the DZ. In these situations, pick a safe alternate spot within your maneuvering range. Don't worry that you won't be landing in the designated landing area, just concentrate on steering for a safe landing. Also, don't wait too long before steering for an alternate spot, or you will be too low to the ground and won't have much maneuvering room. By now you've learned basic parachute terminology and are familiar with the concepts used in discussing parachute maneuvering. You've learned the standard checks after opening, canopy, other jumpers, and landing area. And you've learned how to evaluate your drift so you can plan for your final approach in various wind conditions. If you keep all these concepts in mind on every parachute operation, you should have safe and successful jumps.